Hello viewers, welcome back to Fiverless Gravitas. Today we're going to be going away from, you know, economics, education, and politics mostly, and we're going to be looking into uh, software. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Linux as the operating system that has kind of come to run all the little things in our lives, but um, it's one of those things that you kind of hear all the time and you kind of see everywhere and you know the little penguin thing but you really don't know what it is or how it works or what it's used in and so that's what we're going to talk about today because linux is actually extremely interesting from a technical as well as um conceptual and even uh i don't know what else some other stuff perspectives um <laughs> All the yeah, things no. you said we wouldn't be talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, no, we're going to be talking the philosophy about philosophy and economics and politics. And <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't say philosophy. <laughs> but uh, so let's just get going. And uh, Chris, what is Linux? It showed up in what, 91? <clears throat> now it's here. Um, I'm not it? sure exactly when it showed up. I think it was around then, uh, late 80s, early 90s kind of thing. Yeah, it says September Originally, 7th. 19th, 1991. Yeah, it was originally it was the brainchild of Linus Torvalds, which is why it's called Linux. Um, it was just a pet project. He didn't even plan for it to go anywhere. He was just like, mm, I'm going to write a kernel that just interacts with different pieces of hardware more easily because Windows and Apple didn't yeah. really exist at the time. I mean, they existed, but they sucked. Because <laughs> what I do know is that he wrote it um, on a four 386s and 486s. And for those of you who remember those, those are those computers that were really ubiquitous in the early 90s. And a lot of them had those like buttons that you could supercharge them. Turbo. But, yeah. And then he's, and they weren't like, you couldn't really use it for anything else. But that's, this is the extent of my knowledge of Linux. <laughs> yeah. So historical note. <laughs> so. To make it a little bit clearer, um, Linux is not technically one thing. It's Linux is just the kernel itself. And the X part that came from like Linus Torvalds is his name or whatever. The X part is it's a Unix based system. So it's based on the old, uh, you know, 1970s or 60s systems of Unix. Um, that's probably where most people get the idea that Linux is like this terminal um, well, I don't want to say terminal in case people don't really understand what that means. The command line. A lot mm -hmm. of people think of Linux as like this daunting command line. It's got, you know, no visual appeal and you have to memorize a whole bunch of commands in order to run it. But modern Linux isn't anywhere near like that. What it is, is the kernel that um, interacts with the hardware and tells, it gives access to pieces of software, for instance. That's what'll uh, when you hear about Linux being more secure than Windows or Apple or whatever, it's because you you have control over whether or not applications can change fundamental hardware protocols. It also assign, assigns like encryption keys and memory mapping and things like that, which makes it really hard for a Trojan or a virus to like hijack it because every time you try and change something in the kernel, it'll ask you for like administrative permission. So anybody running a Linux system would have to like explicitly give a virus control of their computer, no matter how it infected them. And that just makes the system more secure, like fundamentally. Whereas oh, no, um, Windows and Apple, you can hijack things like the background services, like the updates that you never want, but they force you to do through Windows and Apple. Those are easy vectors for, uh, for attacks or for a system to get compromised by a Trojan or a virus or something, because they try and run in the background supposedly to help you, but it's actually for like an ET phone home thing. They send your data off to Microsoft and let them, or Apple, and they let them track what you're doing and what you're using your computer for, how long it's been up for, uh, how often you turn it on and off, how often you reset it, all that kind of stuff. But Linux doesn't have a central command like a company um, profiting from it. So they just really don't care what you do with it. So, right. So like I, I remember hearing that like the new Windows has a Linux shell, a uh, kernel, not shell, um, as its base because it couldn't figure out how to, um, was it, it couldn't figure out how to boot itself up using the old uh, Windows kernel or yeah. a DOS kernel that they were using in. Yeah, I, I joke about 7. it all the time, but it's technically inaccurate. But I mean, okay. it's basically that was you that got that from. <laughs> yeah. so, so what it is, is like 
um, Windows 95 and Windows 98 booted off of MS-DOS and it was just a shell and a shell is just another way of saying like a, a cover for the background. Mm -hmm. So DOS being the command line or the terminal for, for Microsoft. Um, the makeup to the face. Yeah, and then they just put something that's clearer and cleaner on top. So every time you click on something in Windows 95 or 98 or 3.1 or whatever before NT and XP and stuff, whenever you clicked on something, it was actually running commands through the, the command line in the background. And it just well, sort of it abstracts it away from the user. Yeah, that was Alan Kay's thing with um, <clears throat> his uh, attempt to make a child-friendly thing. He came up with the, uh, I guess, the image as a link uh anyway that's just kind of trivia at this point but go on yeah so linux itself is just a kernel and that means that um it it's the command center for your computer to talk to hardware mm -hmm. and that's what makes it more secure a lot of people say that like use linux because it's more secure that's the reason why is because everything around linux uh, distributions also called distros for short um, the different varieties that you can just pack on top of the Linux kernel to make it look different, but still interact with your hardware the same way. Whereas with Windows, they lock that functionality down so that they can try and make um, like animations and stuff a little bit smoother, or more pretty or whatever, but at the cost of the user experience being able to change the taskbar at all. Like even wow. with Windows 11 now, they've shrunk it and put it in the middle. And originally, you couldn't even change it or move it. You still can't move it to the top or the side if you want. But with Linux, it, you, you can have it float around anywhere. You can have three of them if, at the same time if you want. So if you want um, just your applications that show up like in tabs when you have like an open window, you could have those all on the bottom and then like your start menu across the top and then a floating dock on the side with all your, your common apps or whatever. So the the idea of widgets and stuff too is they're all like compartmentalized components that you can just have added in that type of feature functionality was very linux based because linux is entirely like the whole philosophy behind linux is every application does one job and it just does it really well but it's limited it doesn't stretch itself out into the rest of your system and again that's why it's more secure and better with privacy and things like that right whereas with microsoft if you install something like uh I don't know, Outlook Express, it immediately tacks on all this garbage that you don't want to use, like database management. Why is Microsoft Access even like a common feature on people's computers? It's because it's preloaded. <laughs> they give you a whole bundle of things <laughs> until you see we're helping, we're helping, we're giving you so much, and all it does is bog your computer down. Right. Well, well you can't it's... change anything because they've locked down, um, they've restricted access to the the hypervisor, the, the low-level hardware manager, the kernel of windows or uh or mac yeah so that's what uh, when i bought my last latest computer i had to uh i built it pretty much from scratch i didn't like solder the resistors onto the board but um the uh, you know i put all the components together in the box and then i booted it up and i loaded up the operating system which was windows but then what I had to do is kind of backtrack a bit and get rid of the antivirus softwares. I had to get rid of, you know, all the stuff that was in there that I didn't want and just essentially gut the thing. Um, and you can't really gut it with a scalpel in windows. You have to kind of hack and with a blunt ax because you're never going to get rid of everything. And it's still like, I still have the Xbox game bar on here for some reason, even though I don't, but it's so difficult just to do Cortana, standard, which simple goes, things, which spiders. And this is actually, I guess the difference in philosophy is almost embolized by that idea of, of Cortana, which that, 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 that helper on your phone, you have, Bixby or whatever, or Siri or this, which necessarily has to have its tendrils into every uh, part of your computer. So it's like, open this, or where is this, or search the web for this. You're not using a computer. The program is using your computer. Whereas in Linux, you are the one using your computer. And but we're still, it's, it's an excuse for them to allow themselves to record all of your background conversations to like make Cortana better. Like it's an excuse for them yeah. to intrude on your life more than anything. And the fact that you can't take these tools out and they're not helpful or useful and they're slowing down your computer, which you bought and paid for and want to operate mm -hmm. like however you want. My shoes don't tell me where I can walk or run. 
I, I do that. I buy shoes so I can go wherever I want. I buy a computer so I can use my computer. Well, it's not up to Microsoft to allow me to do things with my computer. Well, it's shoes Apple. are a good example of this because you, you don't, um, you don't buy shoes and then have a robot to rock around with them and go get groceries. You will get the groceries when your shoes and, and you're also not told where you can go. Mm -hmm. And, and it doesn't that. prevent you from going in certain places. Like imagine trying to walk into a grocery store and then as soon as you get to the front door, your shoes are like, nope, you're not allowed in here. I'm sorry. We can't go to this hockey game because they're playing against a team that the company that I was built by currently is at odds with and says that I was built by slave labor, which I'm not. Those children were paid. <laughs> yeah. Oops, we want you to update our software. So now we're going to lock down all of your other applications. Yeah. Like that's not even possible on Linux. That, that if, if one of these free softwares I downloaded said, nope, you can't use this until I up, update, it, it has no effect on any other software. Mm -hmm. it, it's not allowed to touch anything else. It can use <laughs> stuff, like it can do read only from libraries that are installed, mm -hmm. but it can't alter them or change them because it doesn't have permission through the kernel. Well, Whereas Microsoft wants that background access, so they leave that open so that they can do it, but that also makes them vulnerable to vi viruses. Well, in, in uh, Apple's even like Apple's probably the worst offender for this, and they've been offending for the longest. Yeah, because, they're both the same. They're well, the Apple too was like you get a computer, and the computer is magic. Deal with it. And that was the eighties. Um, <laughs> whereas Wozniak was just like, uh, if you look at the Apple two and the Apple one, the Apple two is this this brick. It's this you can see it. It's this. Uh, I remember using them in school. It's this gray brick. It had a little slot for a disc in it, and it did what the apple II could do in with apple programs and nothing else whereas if you look at something like the apple one which had more wozniak and less um steve jobs yeah what was his name the guy with the turtlenecks yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I was making sure that that was his actual name because i wasn't 100 percent sure no, i would have corrected you <laughs> thank you um so wozniak's the idea was you had this monitor on top of this keyboard looking it looked like a typewriter like one of those newfangled typewriters not the old types and you took the the monitor off and you could open up the compartment behind the keyboard and you could tinker it was actually accessible and you could put stuff in and that was Wozniak's idea a cheap computer for everyone so an entry level <laughs> computer so you didn't have to go and buy all the resistors or radio shack and you know solder everything and wonder why you know your why you program the computer from scratch like you used to do and it was a really good hobby in the 80s but it wasn't not it wasn't accessible to people who didn't want to be a hobbyist and just needed a computer so it was was a, a hardware guru too like he, yeah. he knew his engineering right down from electrical down to the software level so mm -hmm. that, that's what made him so brilliant is because he was not only the free and open source type where like i want to give this product that people can mess around with and play with mm -hmm. he was the uh um the visionary technician who built yeah. the thing from the inside out and that's that's all well and good but you know jobs said no we're not selling some we're not selling that and i talk about this all every time we bring up technology you know cars see the eula episode but there's we have two philosophies here with apple and and, and linux and uh, is you have one which emphasizes um the user's ability to manipulate to a maximum you it does what you tell it to uh, and you need to be aware of that. And you can be, it's not that hard. Well, it's, it's, it's complicated, but everything's complicated. Like, but, and the other side of that philosophy is it's magic. Just why, you know, go on there, get some recipes, you know, click on this and it opens the place where you can type. How does it do it? Don't worry about it. Now, to be fair, not everyone actually needs to worry about it as much as that bugs me on a conceptual and philosophical and just personal level not everyone needs to know how their computer is you know how the binary is being um interpreted by their computer it doesn't need to happen they don't need to know how the transistors in their in their computer work there's no reason that they can't learn but it's it's not necessary but at the same time the it it limits what you're allowed to do with it, and therefore it limits the purpose of the machine. So you get someone who, like Ted Nelson, who I keep bringing up, who's like one of my favorite assholes in history. Um, and um, 
his speech to at his, his eulogy for um Douglas Engelbart was beautiful and um just he's a jerk and you know it and Engelbart knew he was a jerk but they loved each other I guess and so the idea was this is your machine it's a do all machine it's a a computer in his conception was a multi purpose machine it does whatever you want it to do just make it do it and that's the agency the personal agency you have but then you have the other side of that where it does these specific things and this was i think the difference in philosophies between the two and it shows in the it shows the in their revenues look at their balance sheets these companies are the biggest in the world there are like trillion dollar market caps they're worth more than food supplies, water supplies, medical supplies. Mm -hmm. They're worth more than everything on earth. And all they do is collect your data. They, they don't invent anything. They don't create anything. They don't um, produce anything of value. Like the thing they produce is full of bugs. They give you new versions that you don't want. They force you to up update, which causes issues and errors down the road. Like their product is intentionally obsolete after like the planned obsolescence is a thing. They oh, will not let yeah. you use an old Mac and access the web for your security. Well, yeah. the only reason you're insecure is because of the way they built their products and they refuse to let you manage it. Video so games are the question that I was horrifying for this. <laughs> I was saying that um, they're built on top of Linux. Mm -hmm. What they've done is they're, um, <clears throat> they've built it on top of Linux, uh, Unix based systems, like Unix like systems. So they've scrapped DOS entirely <laughs> because it was useless. But the issue with both Apple and Microsoft is that they're still running the proprietary file systems and their file system is flawed. Their file system is built to allow them access to do all these things. And that's what's causing problems with their software, mm -hmm. but they refuse to change it. Whereas Linux, you can install it with any file system you want. So if you're running a server, you can use uh, ZFS. Uh, if you want some, a lot of ZFS? compression and encryption, you can use uh, ext4 for journaling you can use ntfs if you want the nt file system for windows you can oh, run linux on it but because microsoft won't give out the uh the technical specifications like the iso standard or whatever which would be the analog for it they don't give out that information readily it had to be reverse engineered so linux is buggy because of patents protecting people from actually seeing the code that they're running on their computers now, so the issue isn't must... that it can't run better. The issue is that it's being prevented from running better by companies who want to own your you as property. Surely some uh, ingenious hacker pirate has cracked this and released it. Well, that's what I mean. So you can run NTFS, the file system for Windows, on Linux. But the reason mm -hmm. why it's imperfect and it's buggy is because they're prevented from actually seeing the NT code that Microsoft yeah, uses. Microsoft has a it they had has to reverse interest engineer it. in having Linux be as buggy as possible. Well, just their file system is pure garbage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they have an interest though in people not using their file system on Linux because mm -hmm. they want to. Um, the only reason Linux uses NTFS is to make it usable with Windows, whereas Windows wants to do the opposite. It wants to prevent other operating systems from using it. Well, it's like PlayStation games being ported to Windows. PlayStation doesn't actually, they want exclusive games. So they're going to be like, yeah, you can use this game on Windows, I guess, if you pay some money and then you get the port and it's kind of janky because they want you to buy a PS3 or PS5 or something. But again, what they've done though for consoles is they create an operating system. You good? I'm good. It's just, they, uh, there's some, there's some excess gravity here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Found the gravity, huh? Yeah, there's just way too much gravity here. I shoot it away. <laughs> so even consoles do this. They create an operating system for the console, and they use FreeBSD, which is another Unix-like system. So Linux is a Unix-like system. Mac is a Unix-like system. And now the new version of Windows kernel, the hypervisor, whatever they want to call it, is also a Unix-like system. Mm. But in all likelihood, what they did was they took FreeBSD, which has a different user license from Linux, Linux kernels require that anybody using Linux code keep whatever they develop um, as free and open source. So you can't you can take a Linux 
and create a product on top of it and sell that product, no problem. You have an open license to do that, but you can't sell the original product that you didn't create, right? And Microsoft and Windows, or I mean, uh, and Apple, both have a vested interest in their own proprietary hardware and the proprietary software. So in their interest, they want to use a Unix-like system. They're not, they're not even allowed to use Linux because they don't want to allow the same licensing mm -hmm. that Linux requires. So you can move forward with a license, a commercial license in Linux, but you, it, it's copy left is sort of what they call it. You can move forward with it, but you can't change the original license. So you're not allowed to say that nobody's allowed to touch your kernel because the kernel itself, its license is untouchable. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But FreeBSD, you're allowed to change and, and call it your, your own, and you can do it without giving, uh, I think you still have to give mention in the comments of the code or something like that. But consoles, Mac OS, and Windows are built basically off FreeBSD or some type of Unix-like derivative that allows them that type of control, whereas Linux's philosophy prevents them from using that, if like not because they can't make money on it or sell it, it's the fact that they would be legally obligated to make it open source to the public and they don't want the public seeing what's running on their computer, which again is insane. That's like buying a car and saying you're never allowed to open the hood. Every time the hood or the car breaks down, you have to drive it somewhere else and have somebody else look. You're not allowed to look in your own car. John Deere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so building a console off of um, uh, a system with a license that allows them that type of closure prevents um, pirating. So that the big reason for consoles actually makes sense because if it was just strictly running Linux, mm -hmm. anybody could pirate any game, no problem. Well, which we do. Well, we don't for the purposes of anyone watching yeah. who ever pirated a game. I but when you do that. get a port, it's janky. <laughs> That's the reason for the jank, though. Yeah, it's not because it can't be done on Linux. It's because you're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to see the code that other people are writing. So you have to reverse engineer it the best you can. And that's invariably going to have potholes. Which does make sense for someone who makes an artistic product like a game. Yeah, totally. In my sense, because... Um, and a console favorite... is a closed system, like right. perfectly fine running your own So thing. you release a game, Call of Duty 7, you know, Mushroom Assault, I don't know. And uh, you don't want... You, it's got some new aim and fire mechanics and it's got some new physics in it that you really want to monopolize for at least a couple weeks uh, <laughs> until someone uh, does reverse engineer it at a different company. And uh, you, you want to have your product be on this. Now that that's, that's fair. I can get behind that. But mm -hmm. then you have something like one of my favorite games in the nineties was um, free space Two, which was this space shooter. It was really great. And what they did was they realized that their product was, their product was old no one was going to buy it had no market value anymore so they say you know what there's a lot of fans playing this a lot and so they just released the source code and now you go on to um there's something called the free space source code project free space scp and it's just a bunch of modders remaking the game on their own uh based on the source code because they just said here it's open to the public and that that does make sense to me because you know they they understand it and they don't want anything to do with it if you guys want to play this it's all on you it's kind of what linux does it's just kind of being like you guys want to have this your own way yeah sure here not my problem i don't want to deal with whatever you're going to do with it i'm making a tool i'm not making a product and i think that's the difference yeah it's a huge difference too because that the the only product that Linux is and sells is that kernel, and the only restrictions to that kernel is that you're not allowed to change its original license, and that mm -hmm. that's the big key difference between all of these other. But the interesting thing about it, though, is the community, like you were talking about with Free Space. Mm -hmm. um, they did it the same with like Quake Two. There's a huge yeah. fan base behind like Railroad Tycoon's remake. Oh yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> Open TTT is like an amazing. I was raised in a railway family, so it, <laughs> it just it hits all the right chords with like train logic with signals and and trade routes and stuff like that. The economics in me, but it's also like the train but the, the community is so amazing because it's just people who are passionate about it in their free time all contributing together working together it's like the epitome of all what's great with human invention 
this is kind of why um you see this in like mechanics do this too it's like oh yeah and you know they, they banter and they have their vernacular because they get together because one of the aspects of fixing a car is that it's difficult you have to know what's going on and once you figure it out you get that sense of you know if you turn the car on and it goes whoa, and it makes that right noise and it doesn't explode and you know burn down your garage uh you get that sense of accomplishment and i feel like that would be the same it's the same kind of community with any hobby or anybody who's trying to master a tool um hit phrasing but um they they get that sense of accomplishment after you finally figure it out you know you get it to work it boots up and doesn't give an error message or something and but I here's wanted... the thing even bigger than that it, or the same thing sorry to cut you off but no, no. it lasts forever like yeah. 20 years from now there will still be enthusiasts playing a game with your name on the mod so it's not mm. like you need financial compensation for reward your name gets put there forever until somebody comes up with a better uh, alternative and if there is no better alternative that's just in perpetuity you're famous in in this little community that you love yeah and, and that's sort of the difference though because mechanics it's just one person's car that nobody else sees but like with software it's reproducible infinitely and it's permanent yeah so it's a wonderful well, motivator for just like the recognition less. but at the same time it's it's a personal accomplishment you get that i built this rather mm -hmm. than like if you bring home a, a mac or like a like a laptop which doesn't do like it tells you we're going to do all this stuff and they are lying to you because that's how the apple model works uh, <laughs> um you don't need a mac for your school honestly the only thing you really need are these two things here and once you exhaust this then you'll find out what you need in a computer it's like man i wish i had something digital to write notes on and you'll find out what you actually need but it's kind of that like um they're trying to sell you something you don't need by convincing you this is how you should do uh it in a way but if and you actually, planned obsolescence is a huge part of that right but at the same time I mean, what i'm trying to emphasize here is the um oh the planned obsolescence goes into that because you're apple 3 that's what well, I mean. you know why don't you have an apple 10. they won't even let you run the old computers it's like they just say you can't use your computer because right. it's too old it's your fault you have to buy a new one so, I can run Linux on a 20 year old computer. Right. And it can, it has limits to what it can do because it's 20 years old. But then, you know, if you have a thing is, is that if one of the things that, because we think it's magic, any box that has screws in it, um, generally you can upgrade, uh, you can upgrade a box, like a computer box from the eighties, um, into something that can run, you know, some of the most you know whatever game is out latest uh and all you need is just some ingenuity and a bit of patience and a screwdriver and uh and don't do it on the carpet uh, but the thing is you don't even need a computer you can run linux on anything like raspberry pis are phenomenal they're like 45 dollars for like a, a built-on circuit board and it's got bluetooth a gpu and a usb mm -hmm. And it's powered by USB too. It's just a little tiny thing that they run drones and like TV boxes off of. But you can buy those for forty five bucks. Right. You can write code or do your schoolwork or browse the web or watch YouTube. You can do anything on it. Well, that's kind of what I'm so, think, saying is that tinkering there's no reason is a ten year reward. old MacBook that you spent three grand on can't run. That's yeah. just BS. They're making that up. Like, I don't know. In my life recently, I, I changed. Um... I was tinkering with the trigger on one of my rifles and I, I finished it up and it went click in the right way. And I was just like, oh, that feels good because I was still doing the stuff. But with computers, it's just the same. Like it's it's mechanical. It's just on a very small level. And once you figure out how to like you can plug in a Raspberry Pi with a to your um, with a with a with a microphone on the side of your wall beside your light switch and you can say like, you know, if you hear these syllables or something, then flick switch equals yes, click, and then, you know, light on, light off, and you just like, hey, I did that, I made that. And that's something that really gives you uh, an appreciation for something. Because when you buy something, and this is kind of that weird thing, I don't know if I've talked about this before. When you do something, it has more value to you. 
when you just buy it like if you buy an apple computer you it'll feel disposable because it you have no interest in that thing existing it's just it's it's disposable tool at that point but even though it you know looks nicer than that raspberry pi thing with the wires coming off of it and it, you know the, the 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 solder marks that you know you kind of screwed up there it you'll love it more because you have an interest in that thing existing and that's kind of where I'm think I'm seeing Linux has more of a connection to the user, which allows it to become more of an integrated tool to that user. It integrates further into the user's life than you can because it allows that kind of tinkering, because it allows that kind of integration into what the user actually needs. And therefore, it's a better tool. And I would say it's significantly better. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Not just well, because I like about. it, but it's actually more useful. It's mm -hmm. not only cheaper, it lasts longer, it's more useful. Mm -hmm. And you learn more from it and stuff. But like, just as an example, I got this little motor here. It's just a little water pump from eBay for like $3. Oh, yeah. You can plug this into a breadboard, power it off of a Raspberry Pi, hook some tubing up to it, and then another $3 ultrasonic range detector I got, which is just another sensor. You plug that into the Raspberry Pi, now I, I'm going to build for my mother um, a little water fountain and the ultrasonic range detector will see when you're in the room, it'll start running. So you don't have to like turn it on. It's it just physical. detects people in the room. Yeah. But like for like five, 10 bucks and it's just a cheesy little project or whatever. And it's not like it's worth millions of dollars. It's just the fact that you can do anything with sensors that cost less than a dollar. Like you can get a hundred photovoltaic sensors, light sensors for a dollar. You get LEDs that tell you when the bathroom door is or when the bathroom's in use. So you don't have to walk all the way upstairs and all the way back down if somebody's in the bathroom. You could just wire a little LED to it and then two connectors on the door. When the door is closed, the connectors join, circuit passes, light turns on. Like just simple things like that. But even if it's not interesting to you or like me or whatever, like your kids can do it. This isn't something that's just like, you know, <laughs> Apple and Microsoft make it, oh, don't worry, we'll handle it for you. You can't be in charge of your own security. Here's Norton 360 on your computer. Yeah. And McAfee. nothing runs anymore. <laughs> like it, it's so obtusely useless. All of that stuff that they 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 plug in. Like the the search bar is the perfect example. And this is my biggest pet peeve with with Windows specifically. If I know the name, exactly the name that they're using in windows for a setting and i can't find the setting because they put it in all these different places and they're not all in one spot like linux would be if you type in the search bar it'll automatically pull a bunch of ads from the internet to show you like that's not what you want you're trying to get rid of something from your computer or change something on your own computer and instead of pulling up things that are on your computer like um a perfect oh, example shit. is dx diag dx diag if you don't put the G at the end, it's like, I have no idea what you're looking for, sorry. Then you add the G and suddenly it's like this hidden utility that you need to find out what DirectX version you're running on Windows, which you need for every game. Every single game you play on Windows needs it. Well, okay. But you can't I'm, even upgrade Windows 8 to it. I'm not, looking at not this to 10, right now. but I mean, like, you can't get that, um, the .NET framework update that's required to run any games on on windows 8 not that it can't do it because they've discontinued the updates if you don't already have a running windows 8 with that update you can't get the directx download they just refuse to allow it not that it can't do it and that right. to me is just criminal so i typed in disk and then i got discord which is for some reason on my computer i have to Make sure. Oh no, that's not on my computer. No, it's that's, downloading from the it's, internet. And it's and then it's Discord the movie. It's like, wait, why are you searching Google for me? And so it's like, well, with Bing of of all things. Yeah. Um, and so it's trying to. But it's not a search function. Well, they no, call it a search function, and it's not searching anything. Well, and I never <laughs> use the. I never use the start menu. Like I used to use it all the time because I could set it up. In Windows 95 to XP, I could set it up to, or I could organize the start menu as its own little, um, you know, hierarchical thing. And I, it would be easy to navigate because I could just go boop, 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 boop. And, and you'd like, know it because you set it up. Right. And now it's just, they have apps. Now, if anyone says apps, you know they're an 
you know you know they're a fool because an app is just an application which is which has been a, around forever <laughs> it's a program it's like hey it's a chromebook with apps don't buy that ever <laughs> It's like that that ad I still like I yeah. And that sort of takes me back to one of the great things about Linux is when you type in a search it actually searches your computer and nothing else. It doesn't right. even look online. Well, if you want to go online, you tell Linux, open a browser, go online. Well, this like is kind very of very simple. <laughs> this is going to sound a bit postmodern and I'm sorry for that. But postmodern. When, what? I love postmodernism. I hate it. It's I, I'm so sick of it because I had to fight it so much in school. <laughs> I'm just I'm done with it. It was fun for the first like year and then the but one of the things is it kind of maybe this is um me being an old curmudgeon too, is that if I go on my computer and it does what I want it to, then I'm the control the one controlling my computer. But if they they try and anticipate my needs by putting all this stuff on it. Oh, here the Windows Media Player. Oh, here you need this and all this stuff that doesn't work as well. I still have Media Player Classic on here and I went and put it on and because it's better than... Yeah, it's way better. I use the, the KLM codec MP and it's like from Windows 98 Media Player yeah. just with all the codecs added onto it. Yeah. It's wonderful. And um, then I put the games on as I want them or I put the, I put the, the software on as I want it. And there's, well, no, you just, we have it already loaded, so you don't have to put it on. It's like, no, I want to know, like, I want to shop for my programs. I want to know which ones I want to put on in relation to all the other ones. I need something that does this. And so what I'm doing with the Linux thing is I'm looking for something to work based on function, not on need. I need something that will do this. The need drives the function, not the function driving the need, which sounds kind of obtuse so let me I guess put that a little better um, I want to uh, play a game or I want I need virus security so you have that need I need something that performs this function and so I need the program because of that function and the, the, the program that will perform that function based on my needs my what I value uh, is the one I will choose. I'm not telling what I'm doing because then I'm just doxing myself, but I chose an open source one that is up to date and has, you know, the features I like. So I like, I min maxed it, I guess. But if they're choosing for me, first of all, they're calling me an idiot, but second, that's, that's neither here nor there. The second, they're, they're hoping you're an idiot. <laughs> they're, they're assuming that this is the way I should act with their computer. And so they're dictating essentially how I should use my device. You should be on Discord. You should be uh, you should be uh, using it. This it's supposed to be that slow. Uh, why aren't you using OneNote? Why aren't you using um, I don't know OneDrive? These... Yeah. Uh, let's see, but even microphone. simple things like installing Windows 10, you can't do it without signing in. You have yeah. to sign in. They won't even let you install windows without signing in and registering your account with windows that's insane there's no reason you need an email address to turn on a computer there's absolutely no reason for it it's just right. power running through a cpu and a ram right. like and the the behavior that they're trying to get you to do sorry is to make them money in the end Why yeah they're selling X you Play you're the commodity yeah and so well it's not even that like they're driving you. It's like, look, there's Xbox games on they here. They don't like, do don't it for like power. Games? The only hmm. reason Bing has searches and the only reason Microsoft can say to shareholders, look how many people are using Bing is because they hardwired it into the OS and you can't get rid of it. Right. That's the only reason Bing exists is so that they can tell shareholders people are using it. And the yeah. top search result is Google on Bing. Yeah. Well, and then people I... use Bing to look up Google. <laughs> I, because it's harder to find a place to type in an address directly in Windows and with Microsoft services than it is to actually use it to find your better service. As a joke, I put Bing on my wife's phone just to <laughs> piss her off. But, <laughs> but here's the thing. Linux doesn't, doesn't prevent you from acquiring a service if you like it. So if you want something that predicts what you're going to do and what you're going to say and does web searches, you just install it. You just install an application that does that. And then mm. if you don't want it or you want it to stop, you can turn off the app and it stops. Windows stuff, it just runs in the background. You have no control over it whatsoever. 
And if you try and go through the registry keys, they're like intentionally obfuscated. It's all hexadecimal codes, 64 bits long. There's no way you can interpret that without doing a walkthrough from somebody who's reverse engineered Windows. Well, I keep the task, well, with my Windows, because it's such such an annoying thing sometimes, is that I keep the task manager on, like, speed dial. So I have it, uh, I have it, uh, uh, what do you call it, pinned to my start menu so that I can just have it. But then at the same time... shortcut key for it. The oh. window, Windows T goes right oh. there or F1 or something like that. I oh, can't remember yeah, which. I didn't know that. But like I have it open a lot. But then every once in a while, you'll just see some random like Windows this, this, that, or uh, runtime, the uh, the service module. Uh, you have all Even these services. Task Manager is a Windows product. So they don't show you everything that's actually running no. on your computer. And then, and you can't like, replace it. You're not then, allowed to download a replacement app that does the same function as Task, task Manager, but better. But then, at the same time, you go at, at the uh, while this is happening, you go into the settings. Now, Windows 10 has two different settings. It has the old settings, which make a bit sense. So you go into like. Apps. No, they've changed that now. It's just well, a control center app. Yeah, and they deprecated so, the old settings. Uh, it's just it's so it's so obtuse like they make it hard and they act like it's intentionally hard because they they don't want you using your um your computer they want them to be dictating how the you use your computer and this is the same as you know a console game or something like that now it, i think the best analogy would be that it's like the difference between you playing a console game and you playing a computer game where you can boot it up as you want instead of just like and the console games are the same now. You can't even uninstall apps that come pre-installed on consoles. Mm. That's just as bad. It's the exact same now. It used to be the console was yours. Like when you boot up a PS2, at no point in that operating system is there an ad. Mm. None. Because it's not connected online and it wasn't built in with apps. But now, since the PS3, it's got Netflix built in, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, mm. Crave, like all these things I don't want that are e- occupying my hard drive space and my RAM and slowing down my console. Right. When games you're not are allowed huge. to get rid of them. Or a TV, a smart TV that come pre pre built with all that stuff, you can't get rid of it because that's how they sell the TV so cheap is by getting money from Netflix and you YouTube right. and all that. Well, and they subsidize why, the price of your TV by pre-installing apps on it. Well, that's why I bought a projector that just projects. That's all it does. It yeah. just projects. And it was a fraction, like it's, I got this high def thing, the size of my wall, where if that was an actual TV, it probably would have been like $5,000, but it got it for, I don't know, maybe 800. And it's doing a great job. It's chugging along. I don't have to worry about it. We just hook it up to the computer. And now the computer triples as a gaming console, a TV, movie theater and computer and so it's what you do with it i guess but it what it comes what it comes down to though really is a philosophy Mm -hmm. microsoft and apple have a philosophy that um, they own your usage Mm -hmm. they own your data your privacy your uh and the degradation of your your hardware like the computer you buy isn't going to break on its own because it's it's so hard for a, a computer to wear out they don't just wear out a fan might wear out but like processors that are like micro silicon chips they, they don't wear out and they don't even break generally from static shocks now because the uh well the that's why it's so when well the, when the playstation 3s started breaking down uh, well, it was really cool back then for everyone to load Linux onto a PlayStation 3 and be like, look, I've got my modded PlayStation and like people would mod them and sell them. But one of the things was is that they were using lead instead of copper to save money in the wiring. Now, it conducts electricity, but it heats, le- up. <laughs> well, it heats up. And so you get um, molten lead, which is okay as long as it stays molten. But the moment you it freezes, you'll get a crack. So you'll get a you know, the, the electrons can't jump and therefore it just won't work. But it so also have... helps the wires too when it heats up that hot. Yeah. And then the solder joints, if it's, if the part that's heating up 
like because he travels down metal right mm. obviously so at the point of contact where the solders are on the board if that's one of the if that's the main heat point that's that's stressed under mm. load that solder is going to come loose too because that solder melts easily like it's now not that, meant to take heat yeah now that makes it cheaper but at the same time it also makes it last you know a couple hundred hours maybe and <clears throat> then all of a sudden you're 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 uh you've got a piper weight and so now you have to go buy another one if you want to keep playing your games or send it in and pay money to you know get them to fix it so what like it's it's it's, it's like a perfect example of like they are selling units well we made it cheaper well now you are utilizing the more slave labor in you know mining all those rare earths well, don't don't forget like the pollution, the mercury and stuff in those chips and people are throwing mm. away computers thinking they're too old to run because Windows won't run or Mac mm. won't run, even though the computer is perfectly fine. Right. Like it's perfectly capable to do video editing and browse the web and even power users like me don't need a new computer for almost anything we do. I mean, rendering video is one thing that I yeah. just started doing with you on the on YouTube and stuff here. And I do it's machine learning, viewers. so I, I train neural networks. Like that takes a lot of compute power. Mm -hmm. But like as far as like graphics editing or like uh, audio production, I, I did my whole album recorded off a $300 laptop from 15 years ago. And that was all open source software. Mm -hmm. And then when Windows stopped running on it, I was sort of forced to convert over. And then after like three years ago, I think I converted all my computers over to uh, to Linux, which is one, two, three, four, five computers over to Linux. Not one of them has had any issue running. And they were so bad and chugging before because they were old that I, they were almost unusable even for word processing. Just typing letters was like killing it. Mm -hmm. But it was nothing to do with the hardware. So people no. are buying computers pre-built with Microsoft. They're only using Windows because that's what they, they used in school because schools are paying exorbitant amounts of money out to get licensing across their entire, uh, they get an educational discount for like enterprise edition or whatever, but like they're paying tens of thousands of dollars in Microsoft licenses to restrict people's access to computers so that they grow up thinking that their computers are breaking early because they're running Windows or, or Mac and then they go out and spend two or three or four or five thousand dollars on a computer and it's yeah. absolutely insane because the thing functions that's like and replacing light bulbs in your house all over your house even though they still work like why would you do that one every once in a while well if you have a laptop there's nothing really you can do that thing is hard coded almost you can there's stuff you can do but no linux runs perfect on laptops well i mean like with my computer i find it a lot easier to go into it um well my laptop, my other, my actual laptop over there is dead because the wiring with the power supply is, is bunk RIP. But, um, the, um, with this computer that I've got here and probably my last computer, which that's I was, probably also why it broke though. It overheated because it was chugging so hard trying to run windows after like multiple updates and a whole bunch of file installs and stuff. Oh no. That problem with, doesn't arise. You don't with get my, computers overheating with my, on Linux. Yeah. Yeah. With my pre previous computer. Yes. With that computer. No, I was being a football player with that thing. <laughs> I, was shooting, I was not being gentle with it. Um, I, I fried my power but, just from crypto mining on it, but like but, you shouldn't be mining crypto on a, on a laptop. One thing I'm trying to get at is that like, I've noticed that Windows, and this is this goes back as far as I've used Windows. Um, after a while, it'll start getting slow, and um, it'll just start, you know, it'll start chugging. It'll take five minutes to boot up. It'll because you've got. It seems like it's just got redundant processes that it just keeps building up and has to go through over and over again. And even as clean as you try and keep it, your computer's still gonna. That's the planned up. obsolescence. Though. Yeah, they do that on purpose. So, well, what I have to do is I just reload. Um, I create backups for everything, and then I just make it so that I, you know, I can just redo all the programs, and I get it. I just format and reinstall, which is a pain in the butt. But. You know, after the reinstall, it's like brand new. There's no redundant stuff. I have to go through and get rid of all that other, uh, all those other um, 
you know, scrap programs that are all on there, but it's a waste of my time. See, that process on Linux is made even easier because of the way the file system is structured. When you reinstall the operating system, all that you're reinstalling is the operating system. All your right. settings are saved somewhere else. All your files are saved somewhere else. Um, you Even like your login accounts and your key rings for all your passwords and stuff, you yeah. don't have to re-enter any of that. You can just completely fresh install every day if you wanted to. You don't even need... The, like The only reason you keep it on your computer is so that it boots faster. But right. like with Windows and stuff, it actually scraps the entire boot record. It wipes like the entire hard drive has to get rewritten to to reinstall yeah. Windows. It's insanely long and tedious process. And then once you're done, you have to change all the settings and everything again, unless you're booting from an image. But even creating a disk image from Windows isn't as simple as just typing in the search disk image because Windows doesn't tell you how to find that. You have to go through the settings, go through the backups, go through the history, and then click on the link in the little sidebar that says create disk image because they don't want you to do it. Mm -hmm. But like it's your computer. If that functionality is there and there's a search feature for stuff on my computer, there's no reason I shouldn't be able to find that feature and use it just because it's easier for me, even if it's not easier for Microsoft. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, why don't we talk, unless there's more you want to say, why don't we talk about um, starting it up? Because I feel like a lot of the barriers to entry with Linux is because it is actually harder at first. You know, with Windows, at first, the, the entry to Windows is just, you know, it's, it's on. And so an Apple's even like, you know, it's, it's the, the Apple is lit, lit up, therefore you're on. But getting started with Linux, you actually have to, there's a bit of an investment in time and brain power. Um, there is. When, once you, when you're starting, and that is always going to be a barrier for people who are like, well, I don't like doing things. <laughs> but it's not so much anymore, though, because so many people have had that barrier. They've created mm -hmm. Linux distributions to mimic Mac or to, to mimic Windows. Right. And the only difference is you're now able to find the settings you're looking for, whereas in Windows you couldn't. Mm -hmm. So, like, it runs Windows better than Windows. The mock Windows is a better functioning version of Windows. And the mock version of Apple's Mac mac os the mock version that's built on top of linux is better than the mac os version not just because i think so it's like measurably better it's scientifically better you can it operate smoother you, you can change the settings as you want it's faster probably <clears throat> yeah it's um, light year well with, so, with mac it's different because they have a hardware control too so they're building software specifically for hardwired hardware so it's not like you're using pieces that you swap in and out. They solder it directly to the board to get a faster connection. Mm -hmm. So Macs are going to run faster strictly because you can't change them. But mm -hmm. like that's not to anyone's benefit if two years from now you can double your RAM for 100, 100 bucks, but your $5,000 MacBook Pro can't be upgraded at all. And you have to pay $1,000 brand new to upgrade it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas with a, a PC, you can not only run it on old hardware, which you literally can't do on Apple or uh, Microsoft, but like you can pick a distro and you can multi-boot 15 distros if you want. So you could have that's one a, distro for watching movies, one distro, distro for games, one that's a for, Windows mock-up. What's a distro just for the viewers? Uh, I, I mentioned it earlier. It's a distribution, a Linux okay. distribution. It's the, the shell that's built on top of the okay. kernel. So just like Windows 95 and 98 were a shell built on top of DOS, you've got shells that look like Mac OS and a shell that looks like oh, okay. Windows or a shell that looks like anything else. And the way you browse through them is you just do a Google search on Linux distros and see what they're made for. So mm -hmm. a lot of them, the developers of these distros are telling you, uh, like Red Hat is for enterprise, so you have to pay for it. There's a subscription service, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But you're not running websites and you don't need daily right. updates and dedicated developers to get the first releases of every kernel and stuff like that, right? Right, but, but if, most, you, if, if you're if, running a business and you need something that's going to be there and you rely on that, you probably want, you're paying for not just the license, but you're also paying for it to work every time yeah, you know, and you're paying support. for customer service. You yeah. can call somebody and they'll fix it or whatever. Yeah, yeah, rather than like going to GitHub and being like, what do I do? Yeah, so the option is there though. It's not a forced service, but you can mm. pay for a really cheap license for an enterprise edition, just like you do with Windows or, or Mac. We have that in the archival world where, where everything runs off of but Linux pretty much. 
but to answer your have... question though the distro if you want to just play games on your computer you get mm -hmm. a distro that's dedicated to playing games so that all your video drivers and stuff are set up and there's no pain whatsoever yeah if you want something that just looks nice you can get budgie instead of pop os and then budgie's got little notifications and calendars and it'll sort out like your pictures and stuff for you um if you want something that's easy to use and get started in use mint because you can customize it and make it look however you want instead of making it look like windows or having it look like mac you can have a distro like ubuntu which is just you can make it whatever you want you can have floating yeah. task bars you can have no task bar you can have sidebars I've but the issue ubuntu with ubuntu before so but the issue it, with ubuntu though is that it doesn't play nicely just out of the box with graphics drivers mm -hmm. so that's where there's like a little bit of pain involved because it depends on people's hardware if you've got brand new like um a ddr5 which just came out this year like if you've got cutting edge hardware it's not it's not as easy to run it because you have to wait for volunteer developers to catch up with the hardware right they don't give you any information before the hardware comes out about how it runs like at the hardware level so yeah. you can't write drivers for it until after it's been created and then you research it this is a lot of the problem we have in the archival world where um, a lot of the best programs we have Preservica, which is like an auto, a paid uh, software preservation, uh, well, digital preservation suite. And it works well, as well as any digital preservation can work, especially like with video, digital preservation just takes forever because it's just like, we need a lossless format of a video and it's just like well have fun with that that's going to be the slowest thing you're ever going to do because there's just so many ones and zeros and you need to make sure every single one of them is there and accounted for um but you have stuff like archive matica which is kind of it runs the same program but it's open source which means it's free which means everyone can use it which means it's a good day if it runs properly all day <laughs> and so I feel like there's a lot of this, but to get, I guess maybe to more structure, um, if someone's like me, probably actually, I'm probably the target audience for this, but, um, you know, just random person is running this and they're like, yeah, I want to try that. I want to see, I want a computer that doesn't, you know, chug when I open up, you know, a 10 year old game. Um, but that's the thing. Where All do you get distributions? We'll do that. Yeah. But All where do you get? Yeah. But where do you get started? Like, how do I start? Where do I, like, you, you, what's my first, first step? <laughs> first step is just to Google which distribution you want. So based on your needs, like Research. what you're going to use it for. Mm -hmm. um, I, what I would do is I'd get a separate hard drive, like a cheap hard drive, unplug the one that I have in, in your computer that has Windows or whatever on it, and plug in a new hard drive mm -hmm. and just install five of them. <laughs> So, like, you install, so you install the kernel on there and, and then no, the whole operating system, install five oh, okay. of them. The operating system is only like 10 to 30 gigs. Okay. For um, each one. So if you've got a 500 gig drive, you could easily put up 10, 10 distros. But the, no, sorry, I, I, I'm, I, I'm running here. The distros, do, do they not rely on the kernel or? They do, do they but have... they all rely on different kernels. So one okay. might use an older kernel than another one. That's like the, the enterprise edition will have the most recent kernel. Okay. Uh, so, Ubuntu has like an Ubuntu fork. Yeah. Um, so they'll there's... have their own and they'll come with it. It won't just be like, you have to get, all, you know, you have to get all your Lego blocks. Yeah. It's they'll... part of the install process. The first okay. thing it has to do before it can do anything is know how to communicate with your hardware. So the first mm. thing that gets loaded is uh, into your Ram is like a temporary operating system in your Ram. Mm -hmm. and it loads the kernel into that then it copies that kernel and creates a bootloader into your hard drive Boop. and then that allows you to choose every time you turn on your computer which distro you want to run so right. i have like four on mine because i use ubuntu studio for audio production and low latency for recording mm -hmm. i use a uh, budgie as a backup just in case you know catastrophic failure and i can't get into any of my which has never happened even though i've crashed my computer a million times just running code and stuff that wasn't good things that happened to my grammar. dad once he got a little mushroom cloud on his computer <laughs> once he's just like oh whoops he like the easiest it. thing to do is just download the the image write a usb stick on windows you can't do it built in because the operating system doesn't allow it but you, you download a free program called etcher by a company called bellena 
uh, Etcher just writes any ISO image file to uh, to a USB or a CD. That way, it it's bootable because you need certain files and stuff structured on a USB for it to be able to boot off it. But you can run a Linux distro off of just a USB stick, so you don't even have to install it to play with it and practice and screw around. And from that. USB thing, you can install all the updates and you can actually get a full view of the entire distro from a, a live USB stick. And if you don't like it, just unplug it, reboot, download a new one, write the new image, restart your computer and try a new one. You're on mute. I think I coughed and I was typing, so I didn't want you guys to hear it. Um, now, when you think of Linux or, or Unix or something, you imagine like you have to code everything. You want your computer to do something, you have to write the code in. So if I want to connect this to the internet, do I have to set up the program itself? No, while it's installing, it'll even give you your time zone and your location based on your internet connection. Like okay. you don't even, before you even know that you're connected to the internet, L Linux will just based on your IP address from your router, say, hey, I detected a connection. If you got things like Bluetooth and wireless, then you got to pair them just like anything else. But mm -hmm. during the setup, it's already connected to the internet. There, there's right. no fuss, no muss at all. So if there's something your Linux shell doesn't do, uh, your Linux, eh, what are we, distro and learning, um, doesn't do, then can you, you can just find a program, an app, no, a program yeah. that will... Um, perform that function and then and every only distro perform. will use the same program because they're all running from the same kernel so if you mm -hmm. change distros the program doesn't change at all you can right. use it still so now you have so this is now when you have um when you have windows sorry i'm trying to get this into my head mm -hmm. everything's inside everything else whereas you know you have the the like you said the files are integrated into the operating system structure uh so that you know they, they, they you can't have one without the other but um with it with you linux it reads whatever you tell it it can read and then that'll be separate so like you have a usb which is actually not part of your thing it's just um like you have a files on a usb it's not part of your operating system it's external whereas you put something on the integrated hard drives where you actually have to like um sync them up to your operating system and get it formatted and stuff like that you can just keep plugging stuff in and it'll read it as long as you tell it it's there it'll be able to read it unless there's some yeah and uh, even if it can't there. read it you can force it to read it because like you have yeah. control you're not beholden to the operating system to let you do things mm -hmm. if you plug in a usb and it's not working you can physically change the kernel if you want, recompile it, reload it, and say "work now, damn it." <laughs> no, this is what um, this is what uh, Bit Curator does. It's a um, Ubuntu. Uh, I have a Ubuntu virtual machine on my computer, and uh, it's inefficient, but whatever. And I use it to recover stuff like this. This is completely corrupted. But what I did was I put this in and said, "Read it." get what you can. And then I put those files through Archivematica and then it resolved them. It took forever for like a gigabyte, like absolutely forever. But I got some <clears throat> files back because I told it to read it and said, you know, resolve this, yeah. uh, which was interesting. And so, you can force it too. Whereas Windows, if there's no option to force it, it'll just say, oh, sorry, can't do it. Mm -hmm. It just gives up. Or to right. say, I, I need this specific file. And you're like, okay, uh, like a KBBM 120 whatever update. You have to like scour through w Windows website to try and find this file. Mm -hmm. And then they don't allow it anymore because they've discontinued updates. Like I just tried to do this with a Windows 8 system to upgrade it to Windows 8.1 so that I could mm -hmm. get DirectX on it so that I could do my rendering and ray tracing through it. Mm -hmm. And you physically it's not even available to download not because they can't do it they just choose to not let you function yes. and that was based on an update i didn't even want when i went to shut down the virtual machine it said shut down and and, and update i'm like I, I never asked you to update i never even asked you to download or check for the update like Maybe what are you doing fine virtual machine for people uh, oh, it's 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 like a like, software pretending that it's hardware it's an emulation Kind yeah, of like it's exactly you try right. and emulate a video game 
uh, like a PS1 game on your computer, you're actually creating a virtual PS1 on your computer. Yeah, the reason machine. I didn't want to get into it is because you do have to make changes in the BIOS to allow for virtualization. And yeah. that, that can be complicated to some people. And for most people, it's unnecessary. I love virtual machines because I can play with a bunch of different, like, yeah. I, I can hack around with stuff that might crash my computer, but, <laughs> but you, it's contained in a, in a sandbox. So you can visit websites that, you know, probably have viruses or something, and you can check that file before you use your main computer. You can check it in a virtual machine that's like right. segregated. <laughs> Um, right. But the thing with the distros is because they're all running off the kernel, all they are is they look different. So the settings and the presentation and the themes, um, the, the, the ease of changing around options, like the things that you hate about Mac and, and Windows, that's the difference between Linux and, and Mac and Windows is that you can pick a distro that suits, like, that's easier for you to find stuff or that's mm -hmm. easier for you to see text or something or right. that's easier for you to play games or that's easier for you to write code. You pick a distro just because it's easier to have it already configured and set up in a way that you like, not right. because you, it functions any differently. When you can and then there's pre-installed apps that you can choose to get rid of and they actually leave your computer. Right. Uh, on and there. you and you can actually you can switch them easily. You don't have to like restart your computer every time you want to switch a distro. Yeah, you do because it boots into that distro, so it has okay. to load the kernel to boot into that distro. And different distros can use different kernels, right? Mm -hmm. But the so, thing is, you can um, oh, no, you can share your your the the files that you store everything on your computer are like the file structure of Linux is very uh, uniform too. So every time you plug in a USB device, it actually creates a file in the, in the Linux um, philosophy model. Mm -hmm. Everything is a file. And that way it shows you, or it gives you access to all of your hardware, like the details of it, specifics. And you don't have to like figure out which setting allows you to see information on your computer. You can Google search, like how do I find out what PCI devices I have? And there's a command line terminal or whatever, command line, um, command that you can just enter in and it'll give you that information. So you mm -hmm. only, you don't ever have to use the terminal, but it's there because it's efficient for people. It's the quickest way to do the one thing that you want when you look it up, instead mm -hmm. of having to read like 15 instructions, like go here, click here, check file, then preferences, then hit import, then do, they can just tell you one line that you copy and paste and you hit enter and it's done. Mm -hmm. Like that's, so the terminal looks scary, but it's actually a tool. And right. because of the way modern computers are, like we, we don't need as fast as computers as come out for like 150 bucks. Like the cheapest computer you can get now will run Linux perfectly smooth um, for any day-to-day -day use whatsoever. Right. So bu buying an old computer from somebody who thinks that it's broken and doesn't work anymore, you could get a perfectly functioning computer for like 50 bucks used. Well, they think it's broken, even though it's still got 2.5 gigahertz and eight gigs of RAM. Linux only needs like one gig of RAM and 20 well, gigs of storage. Like, and if it's, you if can't it's even just buy a, a 20 gig hard drive anymore, they start <laughs> at 500. <laughs> if you get, um, that's the thing with new computers, well, not new computers, but like a tower is that, um, if you buy an old computer, just wipe it and then you can just upgrade the parts that you need upgrading. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you but what I was getting at with the file system is because of the way it's structured, you can boot into different distros and have all the same files and settings in each distro. Mm -hmm. Or you can choose during the setup to have separate files and stuff. So like each, maybe you've got three people in the household and each one wants to use a different distro and have their files not shared. You can do that too. Well, and then you can set up one of your kids' distros for um, non-internet use. Like I don't want them going on the internet. I don't want them on Facebook. I don't want them on social media. Um, if they you want can to do that with user accounts though, you don't need to, uh, yeah. Whereas in windows and it's... Mac, it's complicated to use users again yeah. in, in Linux. It's not, it's just a command line. What do you want to give access to? What do you want to prevent access from? It's really straightforward. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Yeah. Well with windows, you're, everyone's like, oh, you're the, you're the administrator. It's like, no, the administrator is just a user. The, the administrator is actually Microsoft. You're in the system. Where, well, it's a level that, of privilege though. You're not yeah. like if, if you're just a, a common user, you're not allowed to change system settings, for example. Mm -hmm. But and Linux has the same thing, but their users can be assigned to groups, for instance. 
So you can say all the users from this group don't have internet access. So if you've got three kids and only one of them you want to allow internet access to, yeah. you just change the user privilege from that one user as well, opposed to all of them. If they want to, if they really want internet access, they can earn it by hacking the system. It's like, <laughs> huh, he got into the internet, you know, fair. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. There is no hack. If you have, if you don't have the password, you have to wipe the, the entire, oh, really? like you have to install a fresh version and put in a new password. Well, if they did that behind my back, I'd be pretty impressed. So, <laughs> but they didn't have to, they could just get a USB yeah. drive, plug it in and boot off the USB drive. You'd yeah. never even know because it doesn't need a hard drive to run. That's how lightweight it is. <laughs> so what most people get wrong about, or not get wrong, but the misconception that people have of Linux is that um, it's hard and it's actually way easier than Mac or Windows. The only difference is you weren't raised with it. So you don't have all those years of background use while you were in school for 12 years where you constantly use the same operating system. Right. Like, it was hard to learn Windows, and it's even harder still to have to relearn it every five or ten years because they come out with a version that's completely different from the old ones. That's way harder than having Linux that's consistent across the entire board. Well, no, and then you find yourself, like, you get a new operating system in Windows, and you find yourself with either with new features that you don't want, or like tons of new features like Cortana or Bixby or something on your phone. And then you have features that you don't get to have anymore. Like I don't really have access, like the op, the like again. I keep bringing up the control panel. Control panel is now settings, and uh, and it's an app now. <laughs> it's an yeah. Uh, Wi-Fi, internet, system, devices, phone. I mean, I have to go actually type in device manager to get to. I was installing a bunch of hard drives lately because I just bought a bunch of memory, and I. I have to click on device manager to actually bring on the old device manager in Windows, which I have up now. And in order to, you know, the or disk manager is what I was using. And so I have to type that in and it's like create and format hard disk position. No, it's disk management. You don't need to tell me what it does. The description is not the title. Yeah, like, it's harder to find the app than it, and then it tells you the description after the fact. You're like, I had to manually find this thing. I know right. what it's for already. <laughs> and so I have to like manually go in and do this, which is a pain. They don't like, I'm just adding memory. And so if I want to look this up, I, it's, it's so Byzantine. And then one of the things in settings is gaming, where it's, how is that, you know, Oh, I had it on. Why is it on? I thought I turned this off. <laughs> Xbox game bars. Why? Like, why is that even a thing on my computer? This is an extra thing that just clouds my computer. And a normal person, when they're using a computer, I try. I oh my god, do I try? Um, will um, uh, have just files like, ooh, this is a good you know, uh, image that I could use on my, you know, in my studies and you have all the stuff and you could just get a clutter of stuff. And so you try and organize it. That's normal. You know, you have like 15 games and they're all kind of have do their own things. But when that's put on top of a mess, it makes it just so, uh, annoying. And when I go and delete everything from my computer, I have the main hard drive is a 230, 260 gigabyte uh hard drive which is the main one i guess um this computer is a bit older and when i delete everything on all of my stuff off of it all the programs that i've put on there's still 190 gigabytes worth of operating system and well, what they're just... doing that's a page file so mm -hmm. in, in order to make windows look faster than it is mm -hmm. they store an, uh, a virtual file Mm -hmm. And that file size is based on how much free space is on the disk. Right. So they occupy and burn out your hardware needlessly mm -hmm. just so that you can do things like hibernate yeah. or like fast boot that skips the post boot process or whatever, the power on self test. Mm -hmm. So if you want windows on an SSD, it takes about eight seconds to boot. If you want it to boot in six seconds, all I have to do is occupy a hundred gigabytes, half of your hard drive space. Like, I didn't want that. Why would that be a standard default feature that's like almost impossible to find or trace down? And then they call it pagefile.sys. 
Like mm. that's not at all obvious or clear to anybody on their computer. And then if you go to clean um, disk uh, management or whatever, like you were doing, and you go yeah. to like cleanup tools, there are tools that will get rid of all this stuff. But again, the tool doesn't tell you how it's getting rid of it. All it says is, don't worry, trust us, we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Like we can free up this much space for you, but it's your stuff. Like you don't get to make a mess in my house and then pat yourself on the back for cleaning it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like, that's why I have to go through like, I also know I'll go through and just delete, delete, delete a bunch of stuff and I'll try and get rid of programs, but there's always vestigial stuff. Yeah. With every program you install on Windows, there's always just vestigial files and code that are just there. The next time you turn the computer on, when it sees that it's missing, it'll just rewrite it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even ask you. It doesn't tell you. It doesn't give you a prompt. It doesn't do anything like that. You have to manually shut off vir uh, virtual memory. Mm -hmm. Because virtual memory by default is just a percentage of your hard drive. They just assume that they have all, you know, they can use up your hard drive space. Whereas in Linux, you can choose to do that. And they have tools that make it super simple. Uh, Mint comes with a backup that I really like, a backup tool called TimeShift mm -hmm. that stores um, incremental images. So only changed files are saved so that it keeps the file sizes down. But then you can restore a backup from like any day from you know, one week or like there's a weekly, a daily, you can do an hourly backup if you want. And then you can restore precisely the moment, the time that you want your computer back to. Mm -hmm. And Windows doesn't offer any of that. If you back something up and it takes you like four hours or whatever for that backup to run, every time you run a backup, there's just gonna be a giant file sitting there. And you, you can only hope that that backup works because yeah. you have no idea what it did. It doesn't tell you what it's storing. It doesn't tell you where it's storing it. It doesn't tell you any of that because they hide it from you thinking you're too dumb to do it on your own. Right, you might, well, it's, you can't even get into, like once you, there's certain files you can't go into because it's just like, you're not allowed in here. Like, because they'll think people just delete system 32. It's like that old, um, it's like that old meme where the guy, the old guy's just on his computer, he takes my, my computer, icon and he drags it over to recycle bin and goes empty recycle bin and the computer just boops out of existence mm -hmm. it's just like that's what they think we are and you know it's insulting but the funny thing is you can do that in linux and completely screw up the distro like the whole thing mm -hmm. you can do that but all your files and stuff are fine because they're segregated there's right. everything's compartmentalized in, in linux so the next time you reinstall over top of the thing you just destroyed because you did super user do in the command line and, you know, rm star dot star from the root directory. Like you have to know what you're doing to screw up your computer. But yeah. even if you do, everything's compartmentalized and separate. One thing doesn't contagion over to the other. So your files don't get corrupted from corrupting your operating system. It's the philosophy and model is every app or every application or every program is itself limited to what it does all mm -hmm. it does is that one function and every time somebody decides like hey this works really well except for this case they're allowed to open the source code make that change pack the file up and send it to linux and be like hey i made this change to make this program better and they'll just update it right the next time there's an update you know it goes through the process and it takes like a year or whatever to get approved and because they want to make sure it's not malicious code but the right. thing is, every user of Linux is participating in the testing and development of it, whereas Microsoft just tells you this is what you want. They don't right. even act, like they don't they don't read the feedback. <laughs> no. Nobody told them, hey, we should have more Clippy, more Cortana, we should <laughs> have more bloatware, more Bing, more ads in my start menu, harder to find settings. Microsoft like edge <laughs> edge yeah you change the default to chrome it'll still load links in edge they just got sued over that and lost the court case because they were okay. intentionally forcing edge even when people uh disabled it and that tried was to a, install um, it that was a, uh, explorer that was a still court on. case in the 90s or the early 2000s that they lost where they were packaging um they were packaging the because you could get netscape navigator for free and mm -hmm. you just download it because like here's a here's here's a thing um don't use gopher use us because we're 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 better or something and 
it was better yeah for a, for a time it was better but then microsoft uh web explorer and before edge was they were selling it separate from uh the operating system and they got sued for this i can't remember why and they had to trust yes and they um got had to package it with microsoft uh the, the operating system for free uh until about 2008 or 2009 in which they could you know sell it separately again but then by that time you had you know firefox had you know got come onto the system and everyone was giving away their thing for free and every company was like what if i made my own operating system which is you know the bloatiest of bloats which is uh um google chrome um and but there's like a, li a Linux development project of Google Chrome called Chromium, and that's what Edge is built from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Edge built itself a better version of Internet Explorer that's incompatible with Internet Explorer off of Edge, which is or uh, off of Chromium, which is a developer side project, the free and open source version of Google Chrome released by Google. Why? Like, it's would... their development package. No. But they still the install answer. Internet Explorer, knowing it's it's not vol it's completely vulnerable to viruses, so it's in unsecure. It's it doesn't support the latest like CSS and JavaScript uh, ISO standards, so mm -hmm. it can't even operate to a functional standard, a basic level of standard as a web browser. And in 2019, 2020, they're still installing it on people's computers that they, they don't want it. And there's oh. Edge, and Edge is engaged in the same anti antitrust, which is anybody who's in favor of capitalism knows that that means that somebody's that's crony robbing people. It's criminal. <laughs> <laughs> and then they do that with Mozilla and Firefox. They got sued for that, but they pay a fine. The money they make is so much bigger than the fines they pay from the court that they keep doing it. Yeah, it's like a, the, the fine is a cost of business at this point. Yeah. And the, and the government regulators need some income and their only income is through fines. So they allow them to keep doing it without sending anybody to jail for repeat offenders. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, somebody holding a bag of weed three times gets life in prison. Like these guys are robbing people of billions of dollars. And they're like, it's antithetical to the entire well, American dream. The, the well, the, uh, the whole doing? idea, which, yeah, let's not denigrate the American dream because you know, no, but capitalism well, and free markets. The whole idea is that I can that. make it, and I, I don't know why. Like, I understand why people denigrate it, but it is a good thing. Anyway, I, what I want to say is, shoot, I forgot it was a really good point. So good of a point. The best point. No, no, um, that was it. Is that they're trying to convince, you know, you sue them and they get sued. Well, you know, we are an essential service to society. We're the thing that helps drive society. You know, what, where would you be without Microsoft when there are actual alternatives that individuals can use on their own um, that perform the same service except more efficiently and will run anything that you want it to run? Um, and so the the whole idea that these people have a or should have a monopoly because they are the keepers of the magic, uh, the computer magic is absolutely asinine. Um, and, and the costs are severe. Like the cost yeah. of society, it's not just like me being a whiny bitch about um, you know free software and shit like that. Hospitals are still running Windows XP because they they don't have the budget for an upgrade. They don't need it or the new version of Windows won't, won't operate this old version of software that works perfectly fine for them. Mm -hmm. So hospitals and like supply lines are getting hacked because they're all using outdated software that Microsoft chooses not to support. They choose not to let people get updates. It's not that it can't be updated. They choose not to let people get it. If I want to run an old Linux kernel from 10 years ago, all I have to do is download it and run it. Nobody tells me what kernel I can run. All right. But we're running like pipelines off of Windows XP because the operators don't know anything other than Windows and they don't want to learn Linux because that's a cost. Right. But the bigger cost is your pipeline gets hacked. <laughs> Ransomware is a big thing, especially in the last two years. Well, that's all because of the, the software companies. It has nothing to do with the hardware. Right. And like you, you have a pipeline which is definitely more environmentally uh, sound than 
using a train to burn oil to bring oil to somewhere it's like congrats trains are the same thing the schedulers for the trains are using Mm -hmm. outdated computer software that can be hacked well that's the problem utility services are running off of windows because they think it's the only option and windows intentionally makes these things vulnerable Mm because they want your money they want you to pay for an upgrade even if your computer runs perfectly fine they will refuse to allow software to run on your computer right but like hospitals use it. So like imaging, personal data of individual people, like social insurance number, date of birth, address, images of their tumors, their cancer screening, well, actually, every bring, one of their medications, their mental bring health. something up there, which is really interesting. Um, the medical part. Um, my wife, let me just call her my wife. Uh, she was doing her master's and um, her thesis was partly <clears throat> built in uh, Linux. And they're using Linux because in science, a lot of what times what you have to do is you have to build the program from scratch to do the analysis that you need it to do. Uh, and the best way to do that is to just have Linux will let you do anything. And so because it'll let you do anything, they have, uh, and because it doesn't have any superfluous things on the side, it allows for you to, adhere to the scientific method more accurately because there's nothing mysterious running in the background. There's nothing going to stop it. There's no, you know, there's nothing. It doesn't cloud the data. Right. And so a lot of, you can make the data just be the data. And, um, a lot of like you had to, she had to learn, um, command line Linux in order to run these, run these, uh, experiments. And she came back going like, it's it's really cool i just it just does what i tell it there's nothing uh she it's a simple thing it's supposed to be mundane and, and the computer is almost supposed to be something that you don't even notice in your life and a good tool is one that you don't notice that you're using and uh it was so good that my wife noticed how much of a powerful tool this was in comparison to her her computer at home um and i think that's an area where um we're often forgetting about what we're doing is that like science relies heavily on on uh, on on this technology um and crucial to that is we're not paying anything for it this is entirely volunteer Mm. well not not literally entirely There are there, there's a Linux foundation which receives donations and they pay developers and those developers do things like they double check um, driver updates and stuff like that. When people say, hey, I, f- I found a bug and here's how I fixed it. You got to send it somewhere, right? Somebody's got to check it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like you and I or users or whatever, like most people don't don't have to spend a dime on this. And if you're the type of business that you're you're running a profitable operation and you're saving yourself ten thousand dollars in Microsoft licenses, donating a grand a year is no big deal, or even a hundred bucks. If you donate a hundred dollars a year to the Linux Foundation, you're not even asked to do it. There's no mm. pop-ups or verifications or notify nothing. They don't even ask you. But if you want a paid subscription type of model, there's a distro for that. Mm. Elementary OS does that where every app that you you can get, you can, can you can offer donation. You don't have to pay a, a fixed price. Um, most of the apps just say whatever you wanna pay us. It can be a dollar, it can be $10, whatever you can afford to pay for this app. If you think it's worthwhile, it's built into elementary OS because that's just the philosophy of that one distro. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to be, that's the thing. And any other distro can run that same software if they pay for it, but it's just not built into the, to the so you got to find it manually by going to the, the developer's website, for example, because most Linux will have just free software. They don't offer any for paid software. So the, the distro thing is really key to note because dual booting is a thing that you can't do with Windows easily. Like you have to really, really butcher your hard drives partitions in order to fit another operating system and have it work because of their bootloader their reserved system space to you know help you uh get back on your feet if windows crashes or something which again this stuff anyways again yeah that's the worst possible way and there's no option you're not even allowed not to set it up that way 
Like that's the thing that really pisses me off about Mac and, and Windows, obviously, is that they tell you what you're allowed to do. And like, if I want to dual boot Windows and Linux, Linux works perfectly fine. And their new installers are now one click. It just says, we see there's Windows on your computer. Do you want to install alongside it? And it takes care of all of it for you. Repartitions it, changes the bootloader sector, switches the EFI, creates a G GPT partition table, installs um, its own operating system, and then it gives you a bootloader every time you turn on. When all that, but like Microsoft single... could do that. Look how much talent they have. They but buy up single... all the best programmers in the world. Yeah. Well, every single script that you just mentioned is written by someone who has that annoy annoyed reaction to uh some aspect of microsoft that's like you know what that's, yeah. that's, I'm, I'm gonna write a line of code so they fix it for themselves and then they're like why not just give it to everybody <laughs> yeah you know, they put it into the 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 the, the distro and <laughs> it becomes mm. part of it and, and different distros have different installers too so if mm. it doesn't work on one like your hardware is too new for example or it doesn't mm. pick up your whatever like if it crashes or doesn't just try another distro use that installer and then install it from the other distro. You know what I mean? Like there's always those hacky workarounds because you don't have to worry about like a registry getting corrupted or something like that. It just right. works. Just works. Yeah. Like Skyrim. Which is like the Mac slogan, ironically. I thought that was that was um Todd Todd Howard's thing <clears throat> when he was talking about uh Fallout 76. It just works and then it just doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Although that's actually a good example um, of what we're talking about, just going a bit of an aside, because you get these these people who are telling you one thing and and doing another, because they're everything that Bethesda has been making is still running a uh, an engine that was built in like two thousand one, and they're trying to run like two thousand twenty two games with, that. and it's like, and they're wondering why it's buggy and why they can't make money. It's like because you're not. And they're overworking developers and they're not paying them enough right. and they're pushing deadlines just to make money. Like the, the whole, I, the whole company is focused changed to like an EA type of focus. Mm -hmm. And so it's, no, uh, when you, oh, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, <laughs> but I guess, um, moving it forward, um, We'll put a bunch of links in the in the description for you guys if you want to get started and probably for me because I'm probably going to tinker with this once this goes up. <laughs> um, can't wait for these links. Um, and um, I guess the main thing is you just need Etcher because Windows doesn't come built in with uh, with disk image mm -hmm. software. So which again is so ridiculous because ISOs were from like CD-ROM days. Like would you be willing ago. to do a because uh, we've been doing and check them out if you're if you're here would you um we've been chris has been doing the uh javascript tutorials would you be willing to do a uh booting up linux tutorial and maybe uh a... i don't think there's any reason to there are so many on youtube and like those people mm -hmm. know it better than me i just learned all this like three years ago eh? but i learned it from youtube just looking mm -hmm. stuff up because i knew nothing about linux i never used it before I thought it was going to be super hard and complicated. I set aside like three months of my life where I wasn't going to need my computer. I was so scared of switching from Windows to Linux. And within a day, it was loaded up. And then I had um, I had issues or whatever with my, my graphics drivers like I was talking about before, right? Mm -hmm. But it still ran. I just couldn't get like 3D rendering and games and stuff to work. <laughs> but I, right. like my coding was, uh, wasn't using all my cores, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like that's just the one distro. When I when I used a different distro like Studio, it's got all the graphics drivers pre-built because the whole thing's made for low latency and graphics production. So, right. Like, the so distro was built for it, so it was it came if, bootstrapped. If I'm trying to run the new Doom game, um, it'll it'll run Steam and Doom just the way I want it to. Uh, yes. So can... Steam just recently released a Linux handheld game device called the Steam Deck. Mm -hmm. And as part of that development process, they made Steam work super good on Linux. Whereas before, because only 3% of computer users or 2.4% of users were using Linux, and most Linux users also know how to use Windows, there was no incentive for 
companies to spend money on developing Linux software, right? Mm. But now that Steam is using Linux and all these game developers now have Linux as an option, um, Windows is basically hanging on to uh, to Xbox like grim death because that's the only thing keeping yeah. them on their platform. <laughs> But yeah, you, you, Pop OS I hear is the best for games. I don't play games at all, so I, I, I wouldn't actually know from firsthand experience. Well, um, we had a big old game. We had a big old thing on video games a couple weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, I know it's about like, games, but I don't play them. <laughs> oh. Because like the hardware I look into, GPUs for um, concurrent processing for like machine learning and neural nets and stuff like that. Uh, the only way to get good information on GPUs is to follow gaming, because that's that's how these GPUs get developed. That's where all the money comes to for the research. And right. that's, the people paying a thousand dollars for a graphics card are the reason I can buy a really good graphics card for two hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. So, like, thank you for overpaying for your for your gaming delights. I get Gaming's... my research and science for like an eighth of the cost it should be. Gaming's one of those places where the art is kind of driving it um, we didn't really get into that in our video game episode but it, the nature of gaming it's like what can we get away with has always been driving it and it's I don't know, really interesting but i think i, I think oh, a big oh. part to linux though is that people need to realize i was scared to switch too. like I, and i'm i've been a computer guy my whole life and i was scared to switch off windows because i was just so familiar with it it's like it, knowing there's another continent, but having never seen a picture of it, or maybe just a few drawings from caves or something, and then having to live there. You know what I mean? I thought this was the biggest, mm -hmm. but it wasn't scary at all. Because once I realize and I sit down, I'm like, I don't know where anything is. You can just type that question into Google and it will tell you exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. Like the community out there for support of every distro is just phenomenal. You've got people just volunteering their time for like online credit and kudos and thank yous from from strangers and they'll walk you through anything, any problem that comes up. And again, if you have an issue, just boot into another distro or boot off a live USB. Or if you really want to get into the reads, you can you can do virtualization and you can just install a whole bunch of different distros on a whole bunch of virtual machines and spin them up and play with them as you like. But even if you get used to one and you want to change over to another one down the road or later on, like all of your your settings are are you can save them and all of you can get an app list just by typing one command into your uh, into the command line and you can look up that command like to find out how to do it. You can just type in your question in Google and the search results will be here's how you do it visually and here's the one line command that everybody just does the command line thing mm -hmm. right so. Even switching distros from one to another after you get used to one, you, you can change every bit of the distro to look exactly like the old one. And every distro of, of Linux also runs the same apps that are built under the same fork. So all the Debian fork, it's a lot of terms. That's the hardest part is just all the terms and jargon. Mm -hmm. But um, that's just because there's so many options. Like you can't ask for 50 types of cereal and then not have 50 brands of cereal right like right. it's 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 a causal side effect to having opportunity is to have a list of things to be opportune about but even if you stick with the same fork and use like ubuntu or mint or something along the debian fork you're, you're guaranteed that almost guaranteed that all the software you used to runs and all the main software will work on all forks anyway. So like graphics design stuff, Blender um, that I do use for 3D modeling, completely free. They don't even ask for a donation or nothing. Um, all that stuff can be run on different, on all the, the other distros. And when you install other distros, you can use the same uh, file system as the other. So like you're booting off of your operating system from one hard, one partition like say your c drive or something like that and all your files and all of your everything else is d e f g every anything you want you can split it as many times as you want so that when you when you get a new distro maybe f is your next distro you can set the home folder as the same as your other distro so they just point to that other um partition mm -hmm. so because everything's partitioned and chunked it it's it's indifferent to to what operating system is or what distribution of linux is running it it's completely indifferent. 
Mm-hmm. It's even if it has different file systems, like I, I run um, ext4 file system, which is the standard Linux file system, but I have drives that are partitioned for NTFS so that I can share them between my windows because I got quadruple booting on my computer, right? Uh, I use Windows 10 for games when I play games, but they're usually games from like 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can I can share stuff from Windows. Windows coughs and chokes sometimes because it doesn't like the um, it doesn't like the file structure that Linux sets up. Mm-hmm. Remember, I said the NTFS had to be reverse engineered, so it's not exactly a perfect replica of the file system that Windows uses, but yeah. it, it works well enough. So I, I wouldn't run and save important things on the Linux version of NTFS file system, but I use it as like a temporary. So if I want to, oh, when I'm in Windows, I want to listen to this audiobook. I just copy and paste it over into that drive and then I can access it when I'm in Windows. Mm-hmm. Then I can listen to an audiobook while I, you know, play a city builder like SimCity or something like that. So um, b- besides the security, beside the, the money, the obscene amounts of money that we're paying out to uh, Microsoft for a product that's naturally flawed, like from mm-hmm. the ground up, that they know is flawed, that they're intentionally making flawed, same with Apple, <clears throat> besides the fact that they're building their software and their hardware so that you can't upgrade on your own, and it's costing you money and having to buy new computers, not to mention the time you're wasting with the updates and the slowdown from from your hardware that it's not even you responsible for that slowdown mm-hmm. not to mention the disk space that they occupy trying to optimize the, your drives for you right not to mention they're hiding their settings and everything from you and on top of that they're um discontinuing vital security updates and not just security but like graphics hardware drivers dotnet framework like the things that microsoft maintains and owns and manages themselves they're intentionally not making that capable of upgrading they're like you're paying somebody to ruin your life like to make things harder for yourself for absolutely no reason other than um like a fear of the unknown which gets us back to like kind of our fear episode linux is sort of the unknown because it looks scary and daunting and complicated because you don't see it in tv commercials because they don't pay for commercials yeah you don't see it in schools because they don't pay com- uh schools don't pay for well, licensing and you get a lot of people well, i've met a lot of people like this who will um they don't want to think about stuff um uh, I met people who were like, oh, I just do what the teacher tells me. Uh, I don't want to have to, you know, worry about anything else. I, I just do what I'm told or I'm, I, I know what I know and I'm not going to go beyond that because it's not safe out there. And they'll, uh, they will actively not think for themselves because, you know, what if, like, who am I to think for myself? Yeah, that kind of thing. And so then they'll say stuff like, well, I don't know what that is, so I'm not going to use it. Well, you could do some research. Well, who am I to do research? You know, it's like, I'll just, you know, this, I know this. So I'll, uh, I, and you get this with cars. That's why they advertise the way they do. So it's just like Ford. It's like, oh, I need to buy a Ford. It's like, no. You Matthew McConaughey's whatever. Lincoln commercials. Yeah. You buy a Lincoln. Your stress just evaporates. That's yeah. like the commercial. <laughs> You're just sitting there, yeah. I'm at Pay money, point. and you your problems won't bother you. They'll still be there, but they won't bother you. Yeah, it's <laughs> well. Anyone who can afford a Lincoln properly, it's probably not going to have as much stress as someone who's working three jobs, that kind of thing. But uh, it's I don't know. I think the message I'm hearing from you is you're going to have to take a bit of a leap, but it's not as much of a drop as you think it is. Um, yeah it's like thinking you're gonna fall and then not even feeling your stomach rise yeah the fear is so irrational and i felt it too like i completely understand it that's why i'm like drilling it but like even as a hardcore computer user my whole life i was scared of it Mm -hmm. but since doing it for within a month i changed all of my computers over and i just run windows as like a side project to tinker with now Right. Like I just mess with it. I don't actually use it for any productive work whatsoever. I don't save any files to it. I don't I don't even allow it to access my other drives. That's why I use different file systems. <laughs> I don't want it touching my Linux. <laughs> but crucially, if like you when you and I were in school, we were taught DOS, command line. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's the extent of the command line knowledge you need for, for Linux. And the only difference between that and Linux is that you can tell where your file paths are in Linux and in Windows you can't because they hide them from you now. Mm -hmm. Like it's so hard to find out where files are saved. Is it under users? Is it under documents and settings? Is it program 86? Is it programs? Is it app data roaming? Like they have all these completely obscure, needlessly obscure names for why where they're storing your files. So you have no idea where they put them. In Linux, everything you do, folders? you tell it exactly where to go. <laughs> like, like all your installs they... go to the same folders. All your settings are saved in the same folders. If you want something hidden, just put a dot in front. A dot leading the rest of the name of the folder means it's hidden. And then if you want to show, see them, you just right click and say show hidden. Whereas like in Windows, it used to be a quick thing. Then it went to like properties, folder options, view hidden files, okay. So if you just wanna quickly glance at them, you have to change your whole folder settings. And if you accidentally hit the tick box that says do it to all the inside folders too, you gotta to sit there and wait for half an hour while it goes through all these folders and changes permissions. Like it, it's absolutely asinine how they set up your files that you wanna look at. You just wanna mm. see them not even open them or do anything with them. And like all of these little concessions we're willing to make because of our fear is just, it's asinine when you sit down and really think about it. Because what you want from a tool is for it to do what you tell it to do. You don't mm. buy a ratchet for it to go wander off and start ratcheting things I didn't ask it to ratchet, you know what I mean? It Better. only works when I grab it, stick it to a, a, a screw and twist. Yeah, or you want like, what if I painted my own ratchet? No, you're not allowed to paint your ratchet. Why not? Here are the approved color swatches. <laughs> yeah, it's like the old Ford. Like you can have any, you can have it in any color you want as long as it's black. Yeah, and then, that's know. like a perfect example. Like, why can't Windows just allow me to change my start menu? Like, mm -hmm. why is that even complicated? The start menu was invented in 1994. Like. How is that too high tech for a brand new computer running Windows 10 to not be able to change your start menu? Mm -hmm. It's absurd. And we know they're capable because Windows 7 allowed you to do it. Windows XP allowed you to do it. 2003 server, 2000 server, XP Pro Edition, all those. They all allowed you to do it. And then they removed a feature. It's just like the control panel where it used to be easy to see all your devices. Now you have to figure out through the app because they forced an update. It didn't used to be that with like that with Windows 10. That was an update where they re they removed the control panel. Now it's an app. Mm -hmm. So now you've you've allowed an app that runs in the same user space as all of your other software to run low level hardware configurations. Well, that's just a vector for attack. Anybody can write an app. Like you want that built into the OS. That's like the thing that your OS is supposed to do is communicate right. between software and hardware, prevent viruses, not crash. Why would you make an app for your settings and then make that standard and then force the update and then not allow people to roll back? Like it's well, insane what we tolerate last, for the sake of somebody years. else's right to make billions of dollars. So we last, ourselves get taxed instead of them. In the last five years, it seemed like a lot of what They've been trying, they've been pushing a kind of a weird narrative where everything, I remember with Windows 8, it was like, make it like a phone, make it so that you don't have to think about it. Make it so that, you know, you have your, everything's a picture, no everything's text. right. Everything is an app and they, they, they made, they push this word so hard app, 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 app. Oh, get an app. You, oh, I need an app for that. Oh, I'm making an app. It's like, no, you're writing a program. It's like, and the app isn't even the app. It's the program, the executable is reliant on other files. And so, and to anyone who knows anything about a computer knows that this is just, yeah, you know, it's toddler simplification. It's, it's making, it's defining something in a way so that you don't understand what it is. And it's, it, 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 like this is why I'm so insulted by like computer commercials because it's like built-in virus protection. It's like, mm. what do you mean built-in virus protection? I have a virus program or an antivirus <laughs> program. Like it's not built-in. A built-in virus protection would be me not having uh, an internet connection possible in my computer. Like that's built-in. Yeah. <laughs> or not built in, I guess, but uh, it doesn't make any sense. They're trying to make it so that you respond to words in a certain way. You know, app, app is good. I want a computer with apps and you get people going into 
uh like i went into best buy when we were looking for a projector or tv and they're like it can run it it can it can run apps and i was like what the heck are you talking about it's like oh it, you know it works with an iphone i'm like what it's a projector why are you telling me these things and they're like these people don't know anything about computers they know what words react to people because people are being conditioned by a media to react a certain way to words whereas if you know anything about computers all of that is absolute nonsense and you don't need to think about it they're complicating things they're making things uh, they're providing you with anxiety that you don't need uh so that they can again make money so they can sell you a product that you that doesn't work the way you want it to 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 do a thing that you don't need to do when all you really need to do is just have something where you can keep your digital files manipulate programs that you want to do like that's it most people don't need a computer to process 3d imagery it's mm -hmm. like but everyone well it'll still show it it's just like if you want to design 3d graphics and have mm -hmm. like you know what i mean right like, it's not that it can't run videos and stuff like that it'll do anything like that perfectly fine and i think to me this means like when you're going up to a computer and a linux especially and i guess linux is a great way to get into this is what do you need your computer to do? Like, just make a list. Mm -hmm. Literally, just take a pad of paper, make a list. What do I what? do? Everything I've ever done with my computer, what do I do? Yeah, and cross out the things that, yeah, maybe I shouldn't, I don't need a computer to do that. Or no, you don't have to cross anything out. <laughs> and so. Keep the whole and, list. And then with Linux, I guess you could just say, I need my Linux to perform these duties and nothing else. And, and that's just, that is what your tool does. And can I think of any other reason to use it? Well, yeah. And so not many people, like not everyone, like no one's going to need Bit Curator on the computer. Like I barely, I don't even need it on my computer, but I have it because I know I'm pretensions <laughs> to digital archiving, but <laughs> the, uh, it's, you know, so, but then you, then the question is, do I actually, what's wrong with having Windows? Uh, why would I go through all this business of having Linux when I could just have Windows when I'm not going to be doing anything special with my computer? Oh, I just want this. I'll just buy the I'll just buy the Apple because it's safe. I'll just I'll just go with Windows because I don't need I don't want to be thinking about computer stuff. That's not me. And the average person would can be forgiven for saying that, but what would your argument be towards them? You're paying for it. Yeah. Your ignorance, like you're willful, willfully ignoring the fact that you're you're spending money on a licensed product that you know for a fact is going to be deprecated. Mm -hmm. They're deliberately going to make your computer run so slowly over time that you have to buy a new one. That's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is anything you want to do with a computer, you're limited strictly by Microsoft or Apple. Mm -hmm. Like you can't go on a web browser on an old Mac. That's insane. My phone can run a web browser. Like, <laughs> and not even just a smartphone, like a smart smartphone. I mean, like my old Nokia that just did text and weather, like from 15, 20 years ago. That, not 20. Yeah, How 20 years do? ago. 16, I had a cell phone. Um, you can run the internet on those things. Like, it's completely insane to think that you're not paying for it when a computer that works perfectly well dies eventually mm -hmm. when it shouldn't. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you're paying somebody who doesn't need the money. You're better off using a tool that's slightly harder and giving that money to feed somebody rather than giving billionaires and shareholders more from you for a weaker quality product than even free services will give you. Right. That would be my other argument. You're helping someone attain their American dream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The other thing I would point out, though, is that by switching everything over to Linux um, and doing, like you said, make a list of like what you actually do, that, that is how I switched over because I wanted to make sure I was going to be able to do everything on, on my Linux system before I got rid of Windows. Mm -hmm. Like word processing. I write tons of letters. I do tons of, uh, I, I wrote a couple books. So I do graphics editing, um, video with YouTube. Uh, recording, webcams, net meetings, Logisim. So I do like, the, you know, logic gates, how you graph and diagram stuff or like Gantt charts and flow charts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Logisim is an awesome pro, uh, app for that. 
Uh, just a side tangent, like back in the day, we used to differentiate apps and programs. Like a program was a big bloated thing that did a whole bunch of stuff. And an app yeah. was like the clock yeah. or just a, a notepad, nothing attached to it. No error checking, no, no help menu, nothing, right? That was the point of app, apps and that's the Linux philosophy. So what they're actually doing, Apple and Microsoft, they're hijacking the word app to pretend like their shit doesn't bloat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're trying to pretend like you know oh we're the same as them we're just you know neat and tidy and our our our, uh, our installs stay segregated and sandboxed and they don't interfere with the rest of your operating system complete bs absolute bs mm -hmm. but um linux apps they they ask your permission if they're going to go cross platform from one to the other they have to ask your permission right just like windows pops up and says are you an administrator or whatever but it does it at the most the stupidest times no i am a god <laughs> like it'll ask you if you're the administrator when you're trying to like set up a game or something you know mm. or change your audio controllers or shut off your your network adapter because you don't oh. want it sending well it's like your information program and it's like do you want to allow this program to alter your computer it's like alter my computer what are you talking about it's just <laughs> adding more it's adding stuff to my hard drive that's all it's doing yeah Whereas in Linux, it'll say like, this is what it's going to do. <laughs> do you approve all of these? Yes or no. And if you know ahead of time, you can just add a dash Y, like yes all, mm -hmm. like to the command line that you're writing, right? Mm -hmm. So literally every app in Linux runs off the command line in the background. That's mm -hmm. why you don't need to use the command line because they have visual tools that just run commands. Well, and that's what we used to do when, when Windows was screwing up, like Windows XP in 98 and 95, when it was screwing up, we just go to the DOS shell, like mm -hmm. go to DOS and be like, yo, what's happening? Dot, CHKDSK, check this. Yeah. yeah. And you could run everything in the, in the DOS. The problem was, is that it's, it's, it's clunky. Uh, a visual operating system is just it's more efficient that's why we have them and you don't have um, to memorize syntax and error flags you can just check a box instead of remembering what to type in and right. some people type slowly so it's faster for some people to point and click oh yeah and but, it their brains work visually too like uh, and so yeah. that's why well it, it, it anyway that's to, to, to go back to the the ans answering the question everything you use even like microsoft word like an Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations, all of that has an equivalent. Um, there's a little bit of a learning curve because, you know, sometimes they're like, hey, that's a stupid way of doing it. Let's make it better. So mm -hmm. <laughs> like finding the page count is just easier in LibreOffice than it is in, in Microsoft Word. Yeah. Um, moving around panels and toolbars and disabling tool tips that get in your way, like all the things that you wish you could have had done with Windows products uh usually the big fixes are already done in this version in the free open source version because it annoys people yeah clippy there's no clippy remember how much like energy and processing power that used to take up every time it would pop up saying hey i saw you mistype one word you want me to scan your entire document for you and jump in your face and block your access and your view well it would make that like, noise that whew. Yeah, your whole like, fan would just spin up and <laughs> like you're launching a fucking space shuttle or something like that. But like, if you want that functionality, you can just look it up on Google. Hey, I want this little assistant to pop up for me in Linux. It'll say, hey, this program does that. This program does that. This program does that. And then you can read between them and pick which one you want or install them all and try them out. Like the option isn't uh, a cumbersome thing that stops you from doing stuff. It is the opposite. It's liberating. You can use your computer to get things done instead of having to figure out where the the uh, how how the software is manipulating your your physical mm -hmm. machine. You, but the biggest thing, fighting just, your tool. <laughs> <laughs> as a final point of note, the e-waste, the pollution that it causes, this profiteering model, this anti-capitalist model, this anti-free market model of licensed subscription services through us. Uh, uh, operating systems that manhandle your hardware mm. it causes catastrophic destruction of, of nature like the mercury poisoning people in africa because we're dumping all of our e-waste into poor countries well this is kind of decimating wildlife i brought this flora. up earlier if you throw keep throwing away a computer every three years well that's more like you know so that you can write your screenplay or whatever better or like 
mean, okay, I'm complaining about university students now. Yeah, but with their Macs. <laughs> yeah, and they all have their, they are like, you know, 20. Oh, I'm writing a book. I need a Mac. <laughs> yeah, I need a Mac so that people know I'm serious about no, writing No, you a need book. a 2001 laptop. <laughs> yeah. And uh, maybe four. what you need, and like, that's why it's like, you get a tower. You only need, a, you need, you only need the case once. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, like, you upgrade a part at a time and that creates a lot less waste than you know and it's cheap a new computer every year because all of those rare earths need to be mined all those rare earths like all like you said the, 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 the like that's a lot of wasted copper too like copper copper is expensive like mercury a, and cobalt and like yeah all the things that go into the pcbs too like the urethane layers the polyethylenes the hydrocarbons mm. the fluorocarbons uh the pfas the plastics well and All that's that not going is... to and that's not going to innovation either because you're 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 paying a company to literally not innovate it's like yeah. i want the same thing year after year whereas you know if you're buying like honestly if you're buying i need to have the if you're building a tower and you're paying a thousand dollars to have the latest video card and motherboard blah 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 that's actually you know getting more um you're actually supporting innovation because you know those things are uh, state of the art and they're probably not going to work in a couple of years whereas but an e-machine that's a pre-built those are all leftover parts yeah which means uh, but at the same time you have all of your own leftover parts i have two old hard drives down there that are just and i have an a drive somewhere if you buy there. an e-machine like a pre-built system you can't mm -hmm. even reuse those parts most of no. those are proprietary to the e-machines yeah. They intentionally make them so you have to throw them away because they want you to buy another e-machine. Right. Whereas I have floppy disks and I have an A drive that all I all I need is the cord to plug it into my computer. I just yeah. don't really have any reason to look at my A drive <laughs> disks. So but um the they're there and I'm and that's 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 a I think that's a good final point. Um the pollution is huge and just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not there and it's not no. destroying the planet like because it's in people's Indonesia lives in India <laughs> yeah I send our garbage there <laughs> yeah and I think Kenya or Ethiopia or something there's a giant hill that's just electronic waste and like most of that garbage and filth will never degrade because it's it's built and pressed by heavy machinery mm -hmm. like that that's those silicon wafers don't dissolve <laughs> You yeah. need to like dunk dunk them in acid if you want to pull the the uh, the the gold and stuff off them. You have to like dump them in, in mm -hmm. what is it, hydrochloric acid or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's like, it. Yeah, hours. and you got to stir the pot. Like it never breaks down. Corpses break down fast. That do that doesn't. Plastic breaks down faster. <laughs> yeah, plastic breaks down faster. It breaks down faster than we want it to. Actually, it's like it doesn't. <laughs> But anyway, but yeah, but um, the microplastics though, like in the water and, and shit like that, like that's bad too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes from computer waste because plastic is how you bind most of the edges to all these parts. Mm -hmm. So the plastics they use are inherently not, they're not meant to degrade, that they're built not to, and they're, right. they're small because they're built to be small. So like, but the other thing is the cost. Like, instead of buying something brand new for the top dollar, if you buy last generation equipment like I do, every two years you can get these parts that would have cost you three times as much five years earlier. And there's no limitation to what I can do with my system. Like, mm. just because I don't have a one terabyte uh, NVMe SSD that boots in four seconds instead of eight seconds, no effect on my life whatsoever. But thanks to all the people who overpaid for SSDs, I can now get 500 gigs for 50 bucks. And like 500 gigs is a lot of storage. I mean, if you're using Windows, it's not because it'll eat it all up just trying to optimize it to make it faster for you. But if you actually only save files, 500 gigs is huge. That's mm -hmm. like millions of documents, millions. Um, I've got 10, no, 83,000 songs or something in my music library. Um, not all of them are lossless. Most of them are MP3, but they're all CD quality MP3s. It's not right. even 60 gigabytes. And like 500 gigabytes is right? huge for 50 bucks. <laughs> and RAM is so cheap now. You can get 16 gigabytes of RAM for like 150 bucks. That used to be $800. But like nothing you you can run except for video editing and 3D modeling and 
hardcore computer science where you're programming multiprocessor concurrent high performance models or you're like AI. deconstructing dna uh data or something yeah like 16 gigabytes is absolutely huge and you can get it for like less than two hundred dollars where like the amount of processing power people don't even realize what they have in their own computers because of their operating system slowing things down they just believe that you know their mm -hmm. computers aren't fast enough to run it has nothing to do with that it used to be it used to be you needed a faster processor constantly you know when back in the pentium 2 days when you only had 300 megahertz processors yeah there's a limit but we're at like 4.6 gigahertz now 150 dollar cpu is four cores hyper threaded that's eight threads like you don't need that to run an operating system or to do anything that you do in your day-to-day -day life and they're pitching that shit and selling it to you as if it's a necessity based on how slow your old computer is you believe it well and it's just kind of why i like in people's lives and this i don't want to get too far into what i'm about to talk about it's kind of another topic but you get people who buy a camera because they think they need a camera because you know people who have money have cameras and they get a nice camera and then they just kind of never use it i don't need a camera i can take pictures with my phone that's good enough for me i'm not a photographer i don't need a camera the only reason why i have uh like i buy books not everyone needs to buy books i have books because i use them all the time like support uh, the author though yeah when you buy a book it's going directly to the publisher <laughs> yeah and i but like you get i don't i buy tools as i need them and i don't have any pretensions well you know a man has a table saw it's like i don't need a table saw i've got a normal saw i've got a skill saw. It's, that's good enough um for what i need and you know but we have like oh you know this type of person needs um a uh you know this type of truck a computer is something everyone should have though like it increases your iq by like 100 points just by like having it now if you use it properly it actually does do that <laughs> but um the, the a proper tool is, is what you need now getting off of that i think i'm going to probably try and wrap this up usually we have a um a bit of a what did we say a conclusion you know, a call to action or something. But I think instead of that, maybe we should just have a encouragement. And I think you've been doing a lot of that. <laughs> I've been so, trying to. So but keep in mind, I'm, I'm say, not a very good spokesperson for Linux because I've only just started using them. But I it's think the, we did a good job. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, so it's not as hard as it looks. It's not as complicated as it sounds. There's more support than there is for Windows. You don't get those like go visit Microsoft support page. And then they give you like 15 answers that don't answer your question at all. Was this helpful? Give us some feedback. Oh. Like none of that BS. You get actual people who care about what they're talking about, help you directly with your problem. Mm -hmm. Like it's a totally different experience entirely. These message boards through the Linux community. That's right. the first thing. The, the second thing is the availability of apps. I was scared to death that I just wasn't going to have programs to use to do the things I wanted to do. Um, I use Chrome, Microsoft's VS Code. It's a free version for scripting, and it, it's surprisingly good. So I just I use what's good. I don't discriminate. Just because I hate Microsoft doesn't mean I don't use a good tool that they built. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but Stop like clock is right twice a day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, all, all the tools I've ever needed for all of the projects I've done from, from writing books, producing music, uh, graphics, comp high performance computer, like everything is available. And it's none of it's weird looking or hard to navigate the things about these apps. Every time there's something awkward, somebody just changes it. And then that's the new program mm -hmm. because it's a community of open source developers. If something's problematic for you, it's probably been problematic for other people too. So they changed it. And if it looks weird, it's probably because they found something that you didn't know wasn't working well, and they made it better. So you, you actually get a finished, better quality experience, and you don't spend all your time messing about with your, your operating system, getting in your way. Like, you know, hey, do you want to update now? Hey, we did this in the background. Hey, we did, like, there's none of that BS. You just turn on your computer, it boots in five seconds, and then when you want to do something, it just does it. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the, the takeaway should be for people is to not be scared. Like I understand the fear, but don't be afraid. That's how yeah. I, I would end up. Got an old computer lying around. Use it, sacrifice it, spend a weekend. I don't know. But try and build, use an old computer. Build it for your kids. Old computers. I don't know. Maybe we are all kids and we should build it for ourselves. Anyway, uh, I think that was this is a good place to head out. Uh, remember to like and subscribe and share with your friends. I don't know. Maybe that last one's more important. I don't really know much about the algorithm. Nuts to the algorithm. Um, give us a down vote. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that actually does help. Uh, <laughs> it but counts as an engagement. We don't have one yet. No one's disagreeing with us. They're probably just not liking what we say, turning it well, off. I think like, most of our listeners are on iTunes. Not many people are watching on YouTube. What? I don't even have iTunes. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, check out the uh, RSS feed uh, that one. and links to that will be in the description too. But I'm, I'm going to hook you guys up with a couple of my highly recommended um, Linux distros. Like I said, I've tried about a dozen of them. So uh, I'll mark out what they're for. Um, Linux Foundation, open source. What do they call that? The Open Source Foundation or something? Uh, it'll be in the dis. It'll be in the description. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> And then um, some tutorials for installations and stuff like that will link you to as well. Uh, none of which are affiliated through us. It's just we're trying to help out. It's a link. It's on the internet. If, if it's on the internet and you can get to it without a passcode, then uh, you... And without having to enable cookies for, like, tracking. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week where we'll be talking about something. Do we have a topic for next week? I don't know. Maybe we could do open source just in general. Uh, we could. You'd have to do the research, though. <laughs> yeah, I would be doing the research. But we'll see. We'll see you guys next week. We've been tuned into Frivolous Gravitas with myself, Christopher Driver, and the always Me, charming Jordan Mr. Right. Jordan charming Ryan. most of the time. <laughs> Good 55% of the time. <laughs> just like a poop emoji. Yep. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye.